Okay, fear. The F word. The other F word. The F word you must embrace. Yes, you must. And don't offend yourself, as Marie would say. Yeah. Um, so, okay, I want you to tell a story. Because though I don't like that this happened to you, because I, don't, I never want your knees to be skinned ever. Yes. I love the story of when you wiped out on the rental scooter. Can you talk yes. about that? Oh, my goodness. So uh, Josh and I were um, on a vacation. Usually we, we try – at this stage in my life, I try and do one adventure with him a year, yeah. right? And so this is a couple years ago, and we were so excited to be in Italy. And it was a particular place where the way you get around is on scooter. There's not that many cars on this particular island. And I hadn't ridden a scooter in like 20 years. But I was like, ah, oh, it can't be that difficult. I could totally do this. So we rented these scooters. And this is like in the middle of July, which it is hot as anything in Europe in the middle of July. Yeah. So I had on shorts and sneakers, and we're like going over this rental place. And um, I don't speak much. Italian and the folks who ran the woman who was actually the owner of the rental place didn't speak much English. And so while we were renting our scooters, you know, she's like, hey, you know, do, basically, do you need us to tell you what to do? And I was like, yes, please tell me anything. Tell me everything. And so she kind of walked me through the motions. He was like, like a disa to give a break, like a disa to give a gas. And I was like, okay, amazing. I thought I got it. Put on the helmet. Josh and I are like going out in front of the rental scooter place and I cannot believe, I don't even know how this happened, but somehow I both gassed it and braked it like full on at the same God. time. Within like three seconds, the scooter <clears throat> like popped, flipped, landed on top of me on the asphalt. It was, I cannot even believe, I don't even know how it happened. Thank God there were no other cars around. Yeah. There were no other scooters around. I didn't break anything, which was like a miracle because I landed on bare skin. Mm -hmm. And the uh, folks from the rental scooter place and Josh, like they like heaved the bike off of me. And I don't know if any of you guys really – like have you ever tripped or like something bad happens? You fall or there's some type of accident and you feel this wave of shame? Totally. Like this total wave of shame and mm -hmm. embarrassment. Like even though you've almost practically died, like all you're like, oh my God, I'm such an idiot. Like I was so engulfed with embarrassment mm. and humiliation and also just physically shaken up. Like it was the same feeling like uh, when Josh and I were hit pretty bad in an accident several years ago where your body that. is just like vibrating. Yeah. And of course, the folks from the rental agency were like, oh, you know, like, let's don't take, sue us. Don't, don't sue us. Let's take that bike back. Yeah. Like, why don't we give him a bigger bike and you can just sit on the back and be a passenger and like, la, 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 look around Italy. And in that moment, I had a choice. And it was the choice of get back up right. and learn to ride or be a passenger. And I chose get back up and learn to ride because – I didn't want the fear of scooters and scootering and driving to like calcify in my bones. And I knew that I'd done this before and I knew that if I had better instruction that I could totally do it. And so I took it really slow and I had them explain to me and I just breathed through the fear and I got really present and didn't try and make it go away, but just like actually experienced all of it. And it was just a great reminder about how often all of us wipe out in life. Like all of us, whether it's physically, yeah. emotionally, spiritually, financially, creatively, all of us face plant. And so it's not a matter of whether or not we are going to face plant. The matter is, are you going to get back up and ride again? Mm. Well, you say, just because I made a mistake and messed up didn't mean I was going to give up. Yes. And when I read that, I wrote right next to it, I was like, that is so her. <laughs> That's so her. Meanwhile, I would have hired a driver for my Vespa. <laughs> okay, that is not so me. I would be like, Stanley. <laughs> you would have your gin and tonic. I would. You would. Absolutely. <laughs> I would need a lot of time to recover from that. <laughs> um, so another thing that I appreciate, and this is something that I live by, is that you can't amputate any emotions. You can't eliminate them. They're all welcome to the party, welcome yes. to the table. Yes. It's not about crushing fear, eliminating fear, annihilating fear. Correct. Also violent, by the way. Yeah. Um, it, it is about learning to receive the messages because fear is so, so smart. And you talk about this and, you know, fear for me was I feel something, I better go to the doctor. Right? So thank goodness for that fear. Yes. Right? But the trick that you talk about, which I want you to unpack more, is like, how do you determine 
what our message is and, and how do you get out of a place of paralysis? Yes. So like distinguishing the difference between fear and intuition. And I think, so one of the baseline ideas that I'm proposing in the book is right. that outside of the fear of walking in front of like a moving bus or a train, which is really healthy fear, right? Keeps you alive. Most other fear we feel, most other, not all of it, mm -hmm. these days, it's actually directive. So fear is like a GPS for where your soul most wants to go. Oh. And fear, just like an infant or like a beautiful little puppy or even a dog, right. a, a baby or an animal doesn't have language skills. So, you know, Kuma, my dog, barks his head off when he's trying to tell me something. There's the UPS guy at the door, right. like, I want to play ball, you know, any number of things. Or like babies, like, change my diaper. I'm hungry. I'm right. not feeling good. So they're making sounds. They're giving you a signal and you have to interpret that signal correctly. Fear is the same way. She's your friend. She is not like waving her hands up and down, making you feel something to say, stop, don't do it. She's like, do it for fuck's sake. Like this is the thing I'm trying to get you to pay attention to because it's where your soul wants you to go. So that's kind of lesson number one. But then the question that always comes up for people is how do I tell the difference between fear and intuition? Like healthy fear that I should move through and grow through right. versus my intuition going like, no, this is not a good place for you. You need to kind of dial it back. And so there's this really simple test that I've used my whole life. And obviously, you know, after you've kind of done your logical reasoning thinking, right. pro-con list saying like, do I actually want to do this? But you're looking at these two opportunities on paper and you can't decide if it's fear or intuition. By the way, this most often happens when your ego is involved. So when there's an opportunity and there's like either great prestige, mm. you think you're going to get ahead of the pack, you think, um, you know, there's a lot of money involved, you think somehow you're going to be like, oh, I'm the big shot right now. Right. But something in you is like, don't, don't do, do it. it. Don't say yes. Here's the thing. Get really still, get really quiet, close your eyes. You have to go inside for this. And you're going to ask yourself a simple question. Does the idea of moving ahead with this opportunity, with this person, with this job, with this gig, whatever it is, make me feel expansive mm. or contracted? The moment you ask yourself that question, if you are tuned inside, if you close your eyes, I guarantee you this, the nanosecond after you ask that question, your body is actually going to answer for you. There is going to be a visceral, physical response. Expansive will often feel like you're moving forward in space mm. or like a lightness in your chest or your shoulders are back and down or your chin is lifted. You know, if we were talking in Marie Kondo terms, like something inside would spark joy, right? right? It's just right. this feeling. Even if you're a little scared about mm. it, it still feels like this. Contraction, on the other hand, it's like a sense of dread mm. or heaviness in your belly or your shoulders hunching down or even subconsciously your head shaking no or just something is pulling back yeah. even if it doesn't make logical sense. And so I offer that to people because, first of all, it's always worked in my life. Two, anyone I've taught it to, they're like, oh my goodness, this is genius. I know instantly. And here's the thing. You have to be willing to take that leap of faith because oftentimes the deal, the opportunity looks real good on paper, but your instinct knows way better. There is so much more wisdom mm. in your body than in your logical, reasonable mind. And just most of us in today's society, we're just living from the neck up. We're so sedentary that we've lost our ability to tap into this wisdom. We do that a lot together when we get on Skype because we don't live close to each other. Yeah. So, you know, we Skype a lot. Most days. <laughs> we Skype and FaceTime constantly. <laughs> and I, I can't count the number of times we've said to each other, you know, what does your body say? Totally. And, and boy, does it. That it's like Shakira, comes. right? The hips don't lie. The body don't lie. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> um I want to tell a little story about, and you're going to help me with the story, because something that you do so well and you've helped me with is some of our fears are vague. Yes. And when we keep them vague, we can't really understand them. Yes. So for the longest time, I've had a fear of... Roller coasters! Yeah, yeah, yes. Oh my gosh. So you guys, wait, can I just tell you that I didn't really know this. And one time we were at dinner with a bunch of friends and I was like, oh my Chris, gosh. I was like, when was the last time you were on a roller coaster? And she was sitting next to me and I looked over and she literally started 
bawling. Like, I was like, holy shit. You like started crying right there. Do the you know table. why I started crying? Tell us. Because you can persuade, you can sell shit to a horse, okay? <laughs> so I knew what was coming. I was crying because I saw my future self on a fucking roller coaster. That's why I was crying. <laughs> oh my goodness. <laughs> but, but here's the thing. Here's what's so magical. So we're in LA together. We're doing a little artist retreat where you're working on the book and I'm working on a meditation album and we would get together and, you know, have lunch and, you know, share what we had done that day. Yes. And then you're like, we're going to Universal Studios. Is that where we're Yeah. Yes. And I was because like- we both love scary movies uh, and there was yes. October Halloween Fest. Which I'm all in for. Yes. All the time. But I said to you, I'm like, I will go to this establishment with you. If you do not bring up roller coasters, like, I'm not doing it. Y'all, you want to see my face when she said that? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Like, I was just like. She's not having it. I was and, not having it. And it didn't, it didn't matter. So, but, but this is, this is, this is why this is so great. So you literally gave me a lightning laser coaching and I know what's coming from you and I do this myself. So it's like, you know, but still, and you're like, okay, let's talk about the fear. Like, let's really unpack it because that's very vague and amorphous and, and big. But so are you afraid that you're going to fall out? Because there's a bar that goes at – what's that called? The Well, there's an over – depending on what ride we run on, it was like an right. over harness. So I'm like explaining to Chris all of the different things. And I know y'all, they're going to come in the comments, but sometimes they fail. <laughs> Shut the F up, right? I'm like in the middle of doing my business with What do you mean girl. sometimes they fail? I tell her this now. This is after she's been on roller coasters, so she did. Okay, yes, but we went through the we details. We went through it all. And Absolutely. you're like, are you afraid you're going to pee a little bit? Like, you have you ever up. peed before? Do you have – is it vertigo? As an adult, like, like yeah. what is it? Interviewing her. She interviewed me like the best – like Barbara Walters, like Oprah, until I was basically like, yeah, what, what am I afraid of? This might be fun. And – Cut to me screaming, laughing, crying, holding on to you for dear life, and having the time of my life. Yes. And then so after I took her on our first roller coaster, she's like, what else we got? I was like, boom. You did it's another done. one. But the lesson for all of us, yeah. I think the the our fears do stay so amorphous in our minds. And so one yeah. of the things we talk about in Everything is Figure Outable, we take you through all these different exercises. And one of them is a way to take your fears that are like the big, scary boogeymen in the corner that all of us have and get them down on the page so we can look at them and we can investigate them. Right. And then oftentimes they're little more than figure outable paper tigers. That's right. Thank you for that. I want to talk specifically about anxiety because mm -hmm. I feel like over the past years, Gabby, um, first of all, both myself and so many dear friends, dear colleagues, and also our audience, it is a word that is so prevalent and people are suffering so much. So I'm wondering if there's anything that you have to share for folks that struggle with anxiety. You have so many beautiful tools in the book, but is there one or two that we can walk through right now mm. that you found will help people in the moment that they're experiencing it? Yeah. So while Happy Days is designed to really help people find their guided path to their own recovery, there's also in the moment, real-time practices that I teach. And specifically for addressing anxiety, because one of the biggest reasons that we get so unsettled or so flipped out is because we let that anxiety loop take over. And so if we interrupt the pattern of anxiety with the practice, we can begin to ground ourselves in a new level of steadiness and a new grounded energy. And in that energy of grounded steadiness, we can then redirect. And so there's this beautiful parenting model known as uh, is a Dan Siegel model called connect and redirect. And so mm -hmm. I've used it on myself, which is, oh, okay, if I practice these anxiety relief practices, I can connect with myself and then redirect. But I can't mm. just try to do something else without making that connection first. And so there's one practice in particular, there's a heart hold, which is placing your right hand or your left hand on your heart, whichever feels better to you. And I'm actually fascinated to hear which one is more soothing for you. I put my right hand on my heart and my left hand on the belly, but see with, check mm -hmm. in with yourself and see which one feels best for you. This actually feels more calming, my left hand. That's, yeah, that's interesting. It's, it really depends on the person, but you will know it the second you try. And placing your right hand on your heart or your left hand on your heart and the other hand on your belly, and you just take a deep breath and breathe into that space in your body. And then let it go and just feel your butt on the seat and your feet planted on the floor and just get grounded as you breathe. 
This is a powerful position to get into in the morning when you're waking up and you're feeling a little anxious. And it's really creating a sense of safety in your nervous system and relaxing your whole body. And just notice, Marie, what does that feel like right now for you? So incredibly peaceful and time expansive. Mm. What I mean by that mm. is that it feels like you and I are together and we're like the only people in the world and there is an infinite amount of space around us. Nice. Yes. Self-energy. Yeah. yeah. Beautiful. And that was like 10 seconds of breathing with yeah. your heart. Like, <laughs> Come on now. So that's just one of the many methods, and I'm happy to share more if you want, but that's the one I think that is so accessible in any moment, and particularly when we're really feeling anxious. Now, if you're feeling super anxious and you're like, this is the this is the moment I'm like, I can't get out of this panic attack or something, this is something that's very soothing as well. And it's a EFT tapping technique where you tap yep. in between your ring finger and your pinky finger, and you just tap, 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 tap. And as you tap, that's the point that sends a message to the amygdala, okay, it's safe to relax, and settles your nervous system. And as you tap on this point, just simply close your eyes and say, I am safe. 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 You can affirm another affirmation if you feel more called to something else, like I'm letting go, or I forgive myself, or whatever feels appropriate for you. But tapping on that point, I call it the holy shit point. That's the point that when <laughs> the shit hits the fan, you can just start tapping. I love that. How do you know the difference of when you're just out of your comfort zone and when your gut is telling you not to do something? Sometimes they feel the same, butterfly stomach, and I cannot separate them. Any bright, hot, and sexy tip it's about to get bright, hot, and sexy up in here, y'all. All right, I am really excited to, to A this cue because it's uh, one of the most common ones I get asked. I've got two strategies today to help you hone in on how to tell the difference between fear and intuition. First one is this. You've got this question that you can ask yourself to tap into your natural knowing. Each of us has a natural knowing. It's something like a body knowing, kind of like your intuition. And uh, it's a simple question and it goes like this. When you think about doing the thing that you're talking about and you're confused, you don't know if you shouldn't do it or you're just scared to do it, do you feel expansive or contracted? I have no idea what you're talking about. <laughs> so Grace says she has no idea what the hell that means. So let's dive into what expansive means. So if you think about something and you feel expansive, it's kind of like your shoulders open up, your chest opens up, you get really excited. Even if there's a little bit of fear involved, it feels like, oh my God, I'd really love to do that. There's kind of like a forward motion. Everything expands. Now let's talk about contracted. So that feeling, if you think about doing the thing you're thinking about doing, and all of a sudden you start to kind of pull in or your head starts to shake no, or you start to feel a sense of dread or like God that feels like pulling teeth, that's a sense of contraction and that's how you know. If it's a contracted feeling, that's your intuition or your gut telling you, stay away, honey, do not go near that thing with a 10 foot pole. On the other hand, if you feel expansive and you still have some fear, Go for it, it's a good thing. Is that good enough? Great, I get it. See, now she gets it. Strategy number two. You wanna kind of use that same inner ability, but this time you're gonna pull in your friends, and here's what I mean. So as a coach, I often work with people and they'll tell me about their projects that are coming up and I just watch them. And it's really interesting because when people start to talk about their ideas and things that they wanna do, their body doesn't lie. Kind of like Shakira's, my hips don't lie. The body never lies. And when you hear someone talking about something that they really shouldn't do, they actually start to look dead. Like they get pasty, they start to look depressed, almost like their body language starts to pull in. And then when people talk about something that they're really excited about that they should do even though it scares the crap out of them they light up like a f***ing christmas tree so here's how you implement this you got to get some good friends around you and you want to talk through the ideas or this opportunity that you're not sure if you should take or not and have them really pay attention now of course it's important that these friends are honest that you trust them and that they actually care about you and i promise you talk through this and they'll be able to tell in a hot minute whether or not you should go for it just based on how your body and your face is reacting 
Now, finally, I want to leave you with an awesome quote from my friend Stephen Pressfield, who I interviewed here. He has this awesome quote, which says, The more important a project is to your soul's evolution, the more you'll resist it. Booyah, Stephen Pressfield. If, you, if it's safe to do so, if you're not driving in the car, uh, just close your eyes and take a gentle breath in. And let it go. And we're going to do another one. And I want you to notice just how full your breath is. So is it full and going down deep into your belly, relaxed and open? Or is it tight and constricted and up high in your chest? So go ahead and breathe in and just notice. And as you tune into that breath, just tune into all the anxiety that you might be feeling. How much anxiety is in your breath? How much stress are you feeling right now? And give it a number on a scale of zero to 10. So on the stress, the anxiety, the overwhelm about everything that's happening, just give it a number. And would, would this number be between one and 10? Yes, zero to 10, absolutely. Zero to 10, excellent. Yeah. And pick whatever number, and then we'll gently open our eyes and do some tapping. So I'm gonna lead you through. Marie, will you be my echo? Oh, of course. And does it matter what side we're going on? Nope, whatever feels comfortable for you. Great. And you can do eyes opened or closed if you know the points and you like to go deeper and close them. And then I'm going to do the face points for this demonstration. If you're out and about and you pulled over to tap with us and you haven't washed your hands, just skip them. It, the process works great skipping points. It's not... Also uh, too, yeah, not to interrupt you, but for the folks listening on the podcast, will you talk us through just in case I, they can't see the visual? You got it. So we're starting the tap on the side of the hand. It's called the karate chop point. It's below the pinky on the outside of the hand. So you're taking... Four fingers of one hand and tapping gently, whatever hand feels comfortable. And should you and switch hands? By the way, I'm going to be the yeah. annoying person no, asking all the questions. No, please do. I love <laughs> it. Because I know that my audience is going to be like, what, the, what are we doing? How do I <laughs> yeah, do yeah. it? Am I doing it wrong? Yeah, Great. you don't need to switch hands, whatever feels comfortable for you. Yeah. Great. So we're tapping gently. We're tuning into that breath and repeat after me. Even though I feel so much anxiety. Even though I feel so much anxiety. About everything that's going on about everything that's going on. I choose to relax and feel safe now. I choose to relax and feel safe now. And we're still on the side of the hand, tapping gently, even though this feels so overwhelming. Even though this feels so overwhelming. I choose to relax and feel safe now. I choose to relax and feel safe now. And one more time, still tapping on the side of the hand, even though I'm holding so much stress in my body. Even though I'm holding so much stress in my body. It's safe to let it go now. It's safe to let it go now. Now we're going to tap through the points. The first point is the eyebrow. Inside of the eyebrow, right where the hair ends and it meets the nose, you can use two fingers of one hand, the other hand, or both hands. The meridians run down both sides of the body. And you're just tapping gently and tuning in to that stress and anxiety. All we're doing in this moment is we're actually looking to fire that amygdala because we want to counteract it with that calming signal. So just tapping gently and breathing gently. Now we'll move to the side of the eye. It's not at the temple, a little further in, right on the bone, again, one side or both sides. Don't worry about getting it perfect. Take a moment to think about just how overwhelmed you are. There is so much going on and that's okay. There's so much going on, and that's okay. Under the eye, right on the bone. It's safe to feel this anxiety. It's safe to feel this anxiety. Under the nose. And it's safe to begin to let it go. And it's safe to begin to let it go. I hope everyone listening to the podcast right now comes and watches the visual. Just had to say. <laughs> Under the mouth, you're going to go above the chin, below the lip, and that little crease in there, we're tapping with two fingers, tapping gently. It's safe to feel this anxiety. It's safe to feel this anxiety. For the collarbone point, feel for the two little bones of the collarbone. Just go about an inch right below it. You can tap, tap with all 10 fingers of both hands. It's safe to feel this anxiety. It's safe to feel this anxiety. Underneath the arm, three inches underneath the armpit, either side of the body, right on the broad line for women. 
It's safe to feel all the stress. It's safe to feel all the stress. And we'll move back to the top of the head, and it's safe to let it go. And it's safe to let it go. Moving back to the eyebrow, it's safe to breathe deeply. It's safe to breathe deeply. Side of the eye, I acknowledge all my stress. I acknowledge all my stress. Under the eye, and I begin to feel safe in my body. And I begin to feel safe in my body. Under the nose, the more I relax. The more I relax. Under the mouth, the more my body heals. The more my body heals. Collarbone, the more I relax. The more I relax. Under the arm, the more my body heals. The more my body heals. Top of the head, letting go now. Letting go now. And you can gently stop tapping and take a breath in. And let it go. So that was two very quick rounds, and now we tune back in. So we say, first the breath. So go ahead and just take a breath. I know, you know, I tapped earlier this morning, but I've had a busy day, and even in that two rounds, I felt my breath deepen down into my stomach. So just tune into that. And then also notice that anxiety, the stress, the overwhelm. It was a 10 or a 9 or an 8. What's the new number? What came up? And the tapping process is continuing to do that. So we did two rounds for demonstration. A yeah. lot of the meditations on our app are anywhere between eight and 12 minutes to go a little bit deeper. And then we, what happens with the tapping process also too is that we start doing it and we think we're worried about one thing, but all of a sudden we realize, oh, you know what? It's really this thing that I'm worried about. So it's almost like self-therapy where it like lets our unconscious mind give us the truth about what we're feeling, what's happening, and helps us to let go. Hi, Marie. I really appreciate your website. It's been a great resource for improving myself. As a new business owner, a major thing I struggle with is shyness and speaking in front of groups of people. I realize that this is a huge hindrance and something I need to overcome. Do you have any advice or guidance on how I can improve my speaking skills and overcome shyness? Thank you and have a wonderful week, Miriam. So Miriam, let me tell you, you are not alone. Millions of people have this same fear and I got to tell you, I have a special treat for you today. I have a special guest who has helped thousands of people overcome this same fear. And I know that's a big promise, but what you're going to learn today in this Marie TV episode will change your life. And I'm not just saying that because this guest happens to be my fiance. Josh Pice is an actor who's been in over 90 movies and TV shows. And he's also the founder of CommittedImpulse.com, high performance training for actors, artists, and entrepreneurs. Joshy, thank you so much for being Thanks here. Thanks for having me, baby. So um, you're one of the most brilliant people when it comes to this subject, and I've seen firsthand how you've helped thousands of people overcome this very issue. So what's the first step in supporting Miriam and everyone else who struggles with shyness or having some type of thing that, that's blocking them? So one thing that I hear in that is that Miriam wants to overcome shyness. Right. And maybe, maybe shyness is awesome, and maybe it's not something to overcome, and maybe trying to overcome it could be part of the, uh, why she's having a struggle with it. Well, I think that's genius, and I know one of the things that you teach is a completely new way to quote-unquote overcome for lack of a better word, anything that we're struggling with. So yeah. I know, Josh, that you have three really simple but really profound steps um, to dealing with shyness and to be able to really be your best no matter what you're feeling. And step number one for you is you're a vibrator. And that's profound. That is profound. That's profound that if you're a vibrator. So what does that mean exactly, you're a vibrator? Well, what that, can I tell the story about my daddy? Absolutely. Okay. So. My daddy was uh, a theoretical physicist uh, who worked with Einstein for 11 years. And I grew up in, the, in Manhattan, as you know. And in the summers, I would go to Brookhaven National Laboratory. And that's where my dad, he would go off to work and he would do his thing. And I would play with kids and ride around on my bike. And sometimes I would ride up to his office and he had a floor to ceiling blackboard. Mm -hmm. And I would come in and he would be like deep in, you know, thought and he was kind of, you know, doing these enormous calculations and some, you know, I knew the alphabet, I knew the numbers, but there were like all these other images and symbols, symbols and things that he was, 
that he was drawing. And I would just be like, what is he do? And I just remember thinking like all the other kids, you know, in New York, like their dads were like truck drivers or school teachers. It was like things that were, you know, comprehensible to a six or seven year old. Right. And so I was like, the, tomorrow morning, I'm going to grill him. I'm going to find out what he really is doing. And so I was like sitting in the living room and he was like packing up, you know, his bag. And I was like, okay, no, I'm going to do it. And it was like, so what, what do you do? Like, what, what is your job? <laughs> and, um, and he said, well, um, Joshua, and I was like, and he said, you, do you see, you see this table? It's like, you're not telling me what your job is. And it was like, yes. And he said, do you see your knee? It was like, and then he said, the smallest part of this table and the smallest part of your knee, when you break it down to the absolute smallest part, it's the same thing, and it's atoms. Mm. And he said, and that's what I explore. He said, I explore like the building blocks of the universe. Yeah, exactly. I was just like, and, whoa. Then, and then he like picked up his bag and walked out the screen door, and I was just like, whoa, dude. It's like, <laughs> I'm atoms. And I was like, I'm the same as the table. And, and so why that story had such an impact on me is, is later in life when I was starting acting on Broadway and movies and television, yeah. there were times when I felt I would feel so much emotion and sensation and shyness, you know, and, and I was like, and, and I didn't know how to deal with it. And I tried to overcome it. And, and then I remembered what my dad said that, my body is a mass of atoms mm -hmm. and it really something really shifted for me in that moment and i instead of looking at these feelings and they really emotions really are vibrations in different parts of our body right and all of a sudden it was like how could how why should i look at this sensation and it's really no more than this like inside my chest why should i look at that as something bad right like, like if you felt shyness what yeah. you associated to be shyness as a certain vibration. Right, I identified as shyness. But the truth is, it's just atoms that are vibrating. Mm. And that gave me a huge amount of freedom because I stopped associating it with something bad. It was just a vibration. Right. And that's why the first one is you're a vibrator. If we can just recognize that we vibrate and that's just part of life and it's not good and it's not bad. I think I just want to put a little pin in that thought because that's probably one of the most profound things that you've ever taught me is, you know, recognizing that as a human being and an alive human being that we're constantly vibrating yeah. and that we've only learned to label certain emotions and certain sensations as good and bad. And mm -hmm. if we actually remove those labels and just really look at the pure sensations we're experiencing in our body, the physical sensations, right. the vibrations, so right. to speak, that we have so much more compassion for ourselves and we get out of that realm of good and bad and we can actually just experience what it is we're really experiencing without all those labels that put us into a whole mental drama. Yeah. So I think, I think it's really, really profound. And if people really get that, you're right. There's a huge sense of freedom in it. It's yeah. really, really brilliant. And we're always going to vibrate. Right. As long as we're alive. Yeah. We might as well appreciate yeah. it. And when we're not alive and we're like floating around, we're going to, like, remember when I used to feel shy and vibrate? <laughs> we'll miss all that. Which is so So sweet. we might as well party with it now. Right, right. So, so step number two that you have is nickname your vibes. Yeah. Nickname your vibes. Nickname them. So tell us about so, nicknaming. So, I mean, a lot of my students, you know, if they feel nervous, mm -hmm. they, they'll call it, for example, shushy, you know, or whatever they choose. And like shushy, if you go, if you're about to, you know, put yourself out there, go in front of a group of people yes. or ask for a raise or whatever, and you feel this and you go, I'm, I'm nervous. Like or I'm shy. I'm shy. It's like instantly, well, and, and that's bad. We know that's bad. But if you just go like, I'm shushy, it's like, oh, okay. Like I'm shushy. And it's like a little, you know, Jewish leprechaun or something. <laughs> it's, not, it's not anything bad. Right. You know, all of a sudden it's just like, yeah, I'm vibrating and I'm going to go ahead with with the task at hand. So right. maybe Miriam, you know, can come up with, you know, like maybe she can call it Shazam. I love Shazam because imagine if Miriam was like stepping on stage and she was about, you know, to go out and speak in front of like a hundred people. Right. And instantly she gave herself a reframe, like rather than feeling shy, she's like, ooh, I feel Shazam. I'm, I'm Shazam. I'm Shazam. I'm Shazamming. Right now. Yeah, come on. It would kind of be energizing. Yeah. So um, 
I love that. And I love the power of, I think reframes are really, really powerful in our lives. Yeah. And I love the fact that we can have fun with this and you can name it anything you want. Yeah. So um, the third step, and this is, again, this is something really profound. And I've, I've seen your work in action now almost over a decade, and it's, it's incredible. Step number three you have is ride it, don't hide it. Yeah. Ride it, don't hide ride it. Ride it, don't hide it. And, and by that, I mean, if you take this, these vibrations that are happening and you just recognize that it's creative fuel and that, it, and that it's something that's going to propel you into action. Yes. As opposed to, you know, trying to breathe it away and do all our, you know, techniques to get calm. It's like just like let that, it's just energy and yes. let it just empower you to to do whatever there, it's creative fuel. Yes. To, to go out there. To go out there. You know, a few things that you've taught me over the years, um, you know, when someone tries to hide mm -hmm. what they're feeling, you know, whether it's nervous or anxiety or anything that they've labeled as bad, right. whenever you try to suppress or hide it, you actually display that quality even more. Yeah, absolutely. Because you're just trying, it's like, oh, no, I'm calm. Yeah. <laughs> right. And I've seen this in action again, when someone just rides it, meaning they allow whatever the sensation that is to be there and speak authentically from that place, mm -hmm. ironically, the person appears very centered. And they are centered. Yes. It's like the idea that centered is something different than who you are in that moment is, it's a, centered is like if you're feeling this, like you're centered. If you're feeling this, you're centered. It's about telling the truth. Yeah. And, about and the interesting thing is that when you speak from whatever is there, mm -hmm. people are compelled to listen to you. Yes. But if you're feeling this and you're trying to, you're putting your energy to try to be like calm, it's yes. like people disengage, like they can't listen because they're getting a mixed signal. Well, there's a sense of dishonesty, right? It's totally. like the person is feeling one thing and pretending or trying to show something else, yeah. which all of us have such acute BS meters, BS meters totally. these days that yeah. you can instantly fear like, I can't trust this person somehow. You know, I think you've made a really good point once that I heard you talk about where, you know, no one really wants to see, like who wants to see really a calm public speaker? Right. It would be boring. It, totally. Rather to see somebody reveal their soul, reveal their heart, even yes. if they are a little bit uncomfortable, if they just keep going, yes. it's like you just, you, you're just like, you root for them and you want to hear what they have to say because you know it's coming from their heart. Yes. And I think, um, I don't know if we said this before, but one of the other things that's been my saving grace that you gave to me was the idea and the concept and really the truth that if you allow yourself to feel something fully without resisting it, mm -hmm. that it never lasts more than seven to 12 seconds. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. if you just feel like if Marion, before she goes out on stage, you know, to speak and she feels this, instead of trying to put it down, like just fully feel it. It's like you're on the roller coaster, you know, going up and it's like, you feel it, and yes. then it's going to shift and move to something else and to something else. And you just want to let the, this information be your guide track. Yes. You know, it seems like you can't open a book or read a blog post these days without hearing somebody tell you to follow your passion or follow your bliss or follow your heart. And yes, I have said those things too. But today I want to talk about the power of going in what can often feel like the opposite direction. I want to talk about the power of following your fear. I'm not talking about following your very useful fear of big moving vehicles and walking in front of a bus, nor am I talking about doing anything stupid or irresponsible that could ruin you financially. What I am talking about, though, is the power of following good fear, directive fear, the kind of fear that you feel when you have an idea that just won't leave you alone, an idea about doing something that you've always wanted to do, something that's different and bold and kind of risky where part of you is saying, oh no, I actually couldn't do that. But the deeper, wiser part of you wants this thing so damn bad. And the moment you imagine yourself going for it, you have worries like, you know, will people laugh at me? Will they ignore me? Maybe this isn't even really an idea. What if I do it and it sucks? Am I going to destroy my reputation? Am I going to lose my marriage and my family and wind up living on the streets? 
My friend Stephen Pressfield talks about this kind of fear in The War of Art, and he says, Remember our rule of thumb. The more scared we are of a work or calling, the more sure we can be that we have to do it. And he continues, The more fear we feel about a specific enterprise, the more certain we can be that that enterprise is important to us and the growth of our soul. I experienced this firsthand back when I wanted to be a dancer so bad, but I had two big things that were working against me. So first, I had never taken a professional dance class in my life. The only dancing I had ever done was moonwalking in my socks on my mom's linoleum kitchen floor. Second, I was 25 years old, which sadly in the dance world is way over the hill. Now, since I lived in New York City, I knew that the place I had to go was Broadway Dance Center, which is intense and it's filled with the world's best professional dancers. They're all like 16 to 20 year old beasts who've been in ballet shoes since they were in the womb. So here are the kind of thoughts that were going through my head at that time. I am going to make an absolute fool out of myself. I'm going to be laughed at. It's going to be so hard that I'm going to run out of the room crying because I can't keep up. I was thinking, I am way too old for this. I am so not cool enough. And I'm just going to be there and annoy all the other people in class who are actually real dancers. And they're going to wonder, why am I taking up their space? That's how I felt. And yet... Something in me knew I had to do it. I had to follow that fear. So I took a deep breath, I signed up for a class, and I went for it. And I showed up in my crappy little outfit, and I went straight to the back of the room and tried as hard as I could to be invisible. And let me tell you this. The moment that music came on and we started doing the warm-up, I started to cry, not because I was embarrassed or because I couldn't keep up, but because I finally felt like I was home. Following that fear and being so afraid to walk into that dance studio, that one single act of courage created this domino effect throughout my entire career. Now, in terms of dance, I went on to create and choreograph like four fitness videos, and I choreographed for MTV, and I traveled around the world as a Nike Elite dance athlete. But more than that, following my fear that time trained me to keep following my fear, which I still do on a regular basis. And I want to let you in on a little secret. I am still scared till this day. Every time I write and shoot another episode of Marie TV, like right now, or I launch a new program, or I do anything new and creative in my business or my life, I still have those fears. These days, it's mostly like, you know, do I have anything worthwhile to say? Are people going to like this? Is this going to do? well, yada, yada, yada. And those are my good fear indicators to keep going, to keep following my fear, and in doing so, keep growing my soul. So let's tie this up with a tweetable. Follow your fear. It's a GPS for where your soul wants you to go. If you're ready to stop letting stress derail your happiness, I've got a free gift for you. You need to go to marielovesyou.com slash stress log, and I'm going to give you one of my favorite tools that I've ever created. I promise it will help you melt that toxic stress away fast. Go download it now. I'm a relative newbie in my industry and I'm constantly fighting thoughts about not being good enough, not being experienced enough, or not being old enough. Are there any tips for beating down the voice of resistance? Mmm, girl. First of all, Marie, you have an awesome name. (laughs) Here's a little secret I want to tell you. Everybody thinks they're not good enough. The fear of not being good enough is one of the deepest, most fundamental fears every human being on the planet has. My man Josh Pice says this a slightly different way. He says if you listen to your thoughts in your mind, they all boil down to the same thing. I suck. So the first thing I want you to recognize, Marie, is the whole I'm not good enough thing is not personal to you. We all have it. It's like our mind's default factory setting. That's why it's so important to recognize that you have a mind, but you are not your mind. You're also not the thoughts that you think in your mind. It's something I talk about a lot in my book. And it's something my homeboy Eckhart Tolle talks about in all his books. You believe that you are your mind. This is the delusion. 
Second thing we need to talk about is this. Those I'm not good enough thoughts do not go away. The older you get, the more experienced you get, or the more successful you get. I've been doing what I've been doing for a long time now, and I'm damn good at it. But I will tell you this, every time I start a new project, those same old, I'm not good enough BS thoughts come up. But here's the thing, now I know how to deal with them, and I will say, it is a practice. So nobody gets this perfect, you will have to work at it. Here's exactly what to do. When that thought, I'm not good enough comes up, say, thanks for sharing, biatch, and get back to kicking ass. What do I mean by kicking ass? I mean put all of your attention on the person you're serving or helping. Do the work, put your attention out, not on you. If all your attention is on creating results and helping others, you've got no room to wonder whether you're good enough. I have a question about business and fear. I'm 25 and recently finished grad school and have been trying to launch a freelance writing career. I have small jobs here and there, but nothing as substantial as I want and I know I can handle. I know part of it is simply fear of getting started and wrapped up in that fear of failing and even a little fear of succeeding. Hmm, interesting. How can I either get over this fear and start building my business successfully or use the fear to my advantage? This is so juicy, 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 like a ripe peach. Um, here's why it's so juicy. It's not about getting over your fear, it's about getting into your fear. Booyah. No, seriously, it really is about getting into your fear. So here's the whole thing about fear. Uh, and my man, Josh Pice taught me this. Brilliant, brilliant, brilliant man. Fear is nothing but fuel. Fear, if you really break it down, is a sensation in your body. And unfortunately, our society has conditioned most of us out of experiencing it. So it's something that we push against, we resist, we don't even wanna look at it. When in reality, that fear is incredible fuel that can just jet blast you towards your dreams. Here's what I mean. Uh, once a mentor taught me this, that fear is excitement with the brakes on. And the whole secret to using fear to your advantage is to learn how to, what Josh calls, party with your fear. What does that mean? It means experience fear as a sensation in your body without going into the mental drama about, oh my God, am I gonna fail? Or, oh my God, am I gonna succeed? And put all of your attention on feeling what those sensations feel like. Is it champagne bubbles? Do you feel a little bit like when you're going on a roller coaster and you're going up, up, up the hill and you're like, oh my God, my stomach's getting butterflies. But then what happens, right? If you got stuck at the top of that roller coaster ride, it would be terrifying. You'd be frozen in that one spot if you just stopped and you didn't experience all of it. But if you actually let yourself go and you ride the fear, all of a sudden it turns into exhilaration and it's like the best freaking time ever. That is what's possible when you party with your fear. Hey fear, looking scary. Did you, did you gain some weight fear? Looking big in them jeans. All right, so that's all well and good, but let's get more tactical. Now you know how to party with your fear and you're gonna have a ton of energy that you wanna channel into this incredible freelance publishing career slash business. So the first thing that I recommend is clarity. Clarity brings speed and power and all kinds of good stuff. Here's why. You have a part of your brain, we all do, it's called the reticular activating system. Your reticular activating system, yes. It sounds more complicated than it actually is. In reality, it's quite simple. It's this tiny, tiny, like the size of your fingernail, little piece of your brain stem that's responsible for filtering in and filtering out information. As you know, it would be impossible for us to take in the, the millions and millions and millions of pieces of information, of sensory data that's coming in all over us. So the reticular activating system helps you narrow in on what's most important for you. It tells your brain what to focus on. So if you have ultimate clarity about your business fantasy, right? What kind of publications you wanna write for, how much money you wanna make, what are the people that you wanna associate with, like a really crystal clear picture of this dream career that you're creating, your brain will help you bring your dreams into reality. It actually becomes a partner in you having everything you want. So it's really easy, doesn't require anything else besides you having clarity. So the next thing I recommend for you is getting yourself what's known as a power posse. 
When you're first starting out and you wanna launch something big, you're creating something from nothing, you need other awesome people to hang out with, and more specifically, people that are instigating and initiating their own success. Here's why it's important. For any of us who are on somewhat of an entrepreneurial path, we need other people to hang out with. We need to share notes with people. We need to be able to talk about our disappointments, to talk about our wins, and to keep each other going. This is hugely important. I know in my life when I first started, most of my friends were not on an entrepreneurial path and they thought I was an alien coming from another planet. <laughs> so I really had to create my own power posse that helped lift me up and really move me along much faster than I would have on my own. I first discovered you last year when I cut the cord to my day job in academia, and I took the leap to doing my music business full time. I went from making no money from my art to charting number one on iTunes and making a comfortable six figures. One of my biggest struggles is the what if anxieties about my business and the fear of not being able to stay at the top. I do not want to go back to a day job, and I'm often paralyzed at the thought of what the heck would I do if I couldn't do what I love. Sometimes I feel like my business is happening to me more than I'm happening to it, and to a large degree, I have no control over whether people buy my products. Would love for you to A this cue on the fears and pressures of staying successful. Sincerely, Philip. Philip, this is a really good question. You know why? Because not that many people talk about it. And the other reason it's a great question is because you can actually do something to take care of this. So here are three steps on helping you alleviate the fears and the pressures around staying successful. Step number one is you gotta pull the lap bar down. Now people have this mistaken notion that sometimes success is this uphill climb and then you plateau and then you just hang out for a while or you're gonna climb, climb, climb and it never ends. Unfortunately, that's just not reality. Success is a lot more like a roller coaster where there's like twists and turns and upside down loops and all kinds of things that make you wanna hurl and that is true for all of us. So Philip, you need to sit your butt down, secure all your loose clothing and your jewelry, and get ready for one heck of a ride because you're on it whether you like it or not. And I gotta tell you, the little pimply teenager at the control panel will not let you off. So don't resist this fact, just pull your lap bar down and enjoy the ride. Now, I'm not saying that you're gonna have to go back to your day job, but there may be a time when one record doesn't sell quite as well as your last, or maybe you just hit a creative rut. But here's the deal, there's not one great artist or business person or human being that doesn't have downs that go along with their ups. This is a natural part of life. It's the yin and the yang, the back and the forth, the change of seasons. Nothing in this life is static, so don't be afraid of that fact. You need to account for it, which brings me to step number two. Step number two is don't be MC Hammer. Now let me be clear, I do love some hammer time, and FYI, Hammer pants are back. But y'all know about Hammer, right? I mean, accurate or not, legend has it that once Hammer hit it big, he took all his money, started buying fancy cars and big mansions, and then unfortunately, not only did he have to declare bankruptcy, but then the IRS came knocking at his door and they took away all his stuff, and then they said, uh, You can't touch this. Uh, legally, legally, you, you can't touch any any of this. We're gonna take it away right now. Uh, that, we're gonna take that. I don't even, never seen, what is that? Why, do you even, did you spend a lot of money on that? Now, thankfully, Hammer got himself back on track, but the lesson remains, you should always live below your means. One of the best ways to relieve stress and pressure around losing success is just to be really smart and mindful with your money. That means you should live simply, you should save, and you should invest wisely. Now, one of the best things here is that a financial cushion actually gives you a creative cushion. This way, you can keep taking risks with your music. Step number three, Deal with the worst now. Now this is one of my very favorite ways to deal with any fear. You've gotta ask yourself, what's the worst thing that could happen to you if you lost all of your success? Really think about that. And then here's the part that people miss. How exactly would you deal with it? 
I don't want you to just say this out loud. I actually want you to write it down. Really face the fear. What's the worst thing that could happen? And what would that mean to you if you lost all your music business success emotionally and mentally and financially? Uh, would you be out in the street? Would you lose your home? Would you have to be taken in by a friend? Once you get all that down, then I want you to do this. Write down the exact actions you would take if that happened. In other words, deal with the worst case scenario now. What most of us find when we get to the very bottom of our fear is that actually we would be okay. And when we create an action plan, we realize that even if everything went to hell in a handbasket, there are steps we could take to lift ourselves back up. So this is a very powerful exercise for both your conscious and your subconscious mind to start to release these fears so you can get back to enjoying your life and creating music, which brings us to our tweetable. Let our advanced worrying become advanced thinking and planning. Hi, Marie. I love your insight and coaching a ton. Thank you. Thanks for helping me so much already. As a singer-songwriter, I know what holds me back the most is fear of criticism. I've been a musician long enough to know that no matter how hard I try, I will never have a 100% approval rating. But in order to rise to the next level, I have to face critics. My question is, how do I not let criticism crush me and make me feel worthless? Anne-Marie. Oh, criticism. Crazy how scary just the thought of it can be, right? You know, this is a topic that never gets old, and I don't think it's ever going to go away because as long as there's creativity, there will be criticism of it. Now, we've covered this topic before, and I do recommend that you check out these other episodes, but I've got more to say on the subject specifically to you. So today I want to look through the lens of being criticized for your art, and in this case, your music. Now, this could apply to fine art, writing, sculpture, making friendship bracelets, you name it. Every creative person I know has their own method of dealing, and I've got one that you can try. But before I share it, there's three things that I want you to remember. Number one, everything that you love is disliked by somebody. So whether it's a movie or a book or a song or a person, and sometimes something that you love is vehemently disliked by hundreds or thousands or even millions of people. I can't tell you how many times I've said, I've loved a book or I love this TV show. And other people, smart people who I respect, think it sucks. Number two, it's a whole lot easier to critique a thing than it is to make a thing. Critics, whether amateur or professional, whether insulting or thoughtful, are not up on that stage singing their heart out day in and day out like you are. So before you give their opinion too much weight, do not forget to ask, oh yeah, what's the last thing you made? <gasps> oh, <no! laughs> Dance. Number three, you asked, how do I not let criticism crush me and make me feel worthless? I need you to listen up here. Do not give anyone the power to make you feel worthless. Nobody. As Eleanor Roosevelt famously said, no one can make you feel inferior without your consent. And there's no place that this is more true than with criticism. Now, here's an exercise that I want you to try, Anne-Marie. It's called give your critics the mic. So not literally on the stage, but give them a voice on the page, meaning in your journal or on a legal pad or on a computer. Wherever you like to write privately, I want you to go off on yourself. So write out the exact words you think it would crush you to hear. So what could anyone say about you that you would consider bad? Would they say you've got a weak voice, that you're too old to be doing this, that your songs are just bubblegum pop, dreck, that you're pitchy? Got that one from American Idol. Would they say you're a wannabe Katy Perry or a poor man Stevie Nicks? If you've already heard hurtful things, you can include those. Then take a deep breath in and out and read it to yourself. Or if you've got a creative soulmate who just gets it, you can read it aloud to them. Then boom, the worst that anyone could say about you, you've already said, you've faced it. Now I wanna be clear, the point of this is not to trash your self-esteem. It's to bring your fears out 
into the light, because when you do that, they lose all of their power. Just like the boogeyman. That shadow in the corner you thought was a big scary ghoul turns out to be a freaking coat rack. Ooh. 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 <clears throat> yeah. Now before we wrap, there is one more thing that I have to say about your art and what people think of it. Make your music for you. You are not a software engineer that needs a piece of code to work for an end user. That kind of creator must listen to critics to improve her product. Art is different. You make art because you have to make art. Make art because your soul will implode if you don't. Make it because it brings you joy and exhilaration and transcendence. I know you're doing this for a living, so I get that it matters what some people think because you need some people to pay you. But when you're making your art, it has to be for you. Let's finish this set with a tweetable. If you make art, you'll have critics. It's easier to critique a thing than it is to make a thing. Or how about this one? Everything you love is disliked by somebody. That doesn't make it any less worth loving. You know, last year on vacation, something kind of scary and embarrassing happened to me. But as with most things that seem kind of negative, there was this hidden lesson inside. So. Josh and I were on Selena, which is a beautiful little island off the coast of Sicily where the best way to really get around is by scooter. Now, I hadn't ridden a scooter for at least 20 years, but I was super excited to get back on one. So it was this blazing hot day, it was in the summertime and I had shorts on, and we walked from our hotel over to the rental place. Now, I don't speak much Italian and the women at the rental place didn't really speak much English, but after a few minutes with Google Translate, we were ready to just hop on our scooters and start exploring the island. So the folks at the rental place asked me if I was familiar with riding scooters, and I said, no, not really. So they wanted to give me a little tutorial. Essentially, they said that you go like this to give it gas and that you squeeze the handles to break it. Now, I ride my bike quite a bit, and it seemed really similar. And I said, okay, this sounds easy enough, and in Italian, that's, that's facile. So, I put on my helmet, I turned on the ignition, and I got ready to ride off into paradise. Now here's the thing. What I didn't quite realize was that the right lever was for the brake on the front of the bike, and the left lever was for the brake on the back wheel. Now I'm not so sure how I managed to do this, but basically I gassed it and I squeezed the brakes at the same freaking time and within three seconds. I crashed it, I flipped it, and I landed on the asphalt with bare knees and a 250 pound scooter on top of me. Not one of my finer moments. Now, thank God there were no cars coming down the road, and thank God Josh and the folks from the rental place immediately got the scooter off of me and they pulled me onto the side of the road. So, miraculously, I did not break any bones, and I couldn't even believe this, but I wasn't bleeding. I was just extremely shaken up, and I was engulfed by this tidal wave of shame and embarrassment. I felt like such an idiot. Now, the people from the rental place, they were so sweet, and they wanted to take the scooter back. They said, you know what? You can just give this back to us. We're going to give Josh a bigger scooter so you could just relax and ride on the back of his. Now, in that moment, I had a choice. It was either A, I could play it safe and give the scooter back, and then I would be a passenger rather than a driver. Or B, I could get my butt back up, get back on that scooter, and learn how to ride it without killing myself or anybody else. Now, if you know anything about me, you probably know what I chose, which was B. And here's why I made that choice. I didn't want fear to take hold in my bones and start slowly turning me into a person who was scared and small and insecure. Just because I made a mistake and it was a pretty big one, I messed up, doesn't mean I was gonna give up. So I got back on the scooter and yes, I was completely terrified, but 
I started nice and slow, and in painstaking detail, I had everybody explain to me exactly what to do and what not to do. And very, very slowly, I got back on the scooter and I tried it again. First, I um, did a little test. <laughs> I did little test runs up and down this one road until eventually I got comfortable enough to keep going. I told the people at the rental place, I got this. And by the end of the day, I got to be honest, I was 10 times more comfortable and confident than I ever thought I could be. And I was actually able to zip around the island without causing any damage to myself or objects or other people. And every single day after that, as I rode more and more, I got more confident. And as you can see from this little picture, eventually I got really into my little scooter. So you might be asking, how does this relate to you? Well, I think the biggest lesson that we can all remind ourselves of is this. When you get knocked down, it does not mean that you're weak or that you're stupid or that you're incapable. It just means that you're human and that you're really brave for even trying. But I think what's even more important, whether you wipe out physically like what I did or you wipe out in your business or your relationships or some creative project, which trust me, I face plant in those many times myself, let's be really clear. And yes, this one is a tweetable. A fall isn't final unless you stay on the ground. So here is the bottom line. Do not give fear a chance to solidify and harden in your bones. You've got to get back up while the fear is fresh and new, and I promise then you will not be trapped by it. And here is the great thing. Once you get back up, you are no longer the person who fell. You're actually the person who's still riding. Let's talk about the fearless fun. You know, when we were on your book tour, I just got so excited, especially about having this conversation. I was like, this sounds amazing. I know you mentioned it briefly at the top and I mentioned it in your intro, but can you tell us a little bit more, like what was the inspiration? What is the fearless fun? Why did you start it? Where's it at right now? Because I'm so fascinated. Oh my gosh. And it's, it's honestly a great joy of mine. Um, the fearless fund, like I stated earlier, but I'm going to go much deeper into this. We invest in women of color businesses, pre-seed, seed, and series A, which for those who are not familiar with the startup world, that's early stage. So when somebody has a groundbreaking, not idea, but business on the floor, and it's about to have a good run rate, we're, we're definitely looking at that. How this came about, we got into this to solve a problem. Currently, right now, women receive 2.8% of venture funds. Women of color are less than a percent. And African-American women, we are at 0.00006% of recipients of venture funds. And it's so wild because right now, Black women are the most founding entrepreneurial demographic there is in this country. So right now, we're the most founded, but the least funded. So we see that there's clearly a funding issue that's happening. So we got into the space actually to solve a problem. I wasn't aware fully to the extent of how deep this problem was, but I knew that when at 21 from raising capital that I made that promise to myself that one day I'd be the business investor that I was looking to have for myself. And for me, that's a big deal because I love entrepreneurship. And I wanted to definitely get out here and help all the entrepreneurs. So when I started getting bit by that bug around, oh my gosh, 2016, 2017, I'm like, Aaron, you're going to have to remember that promise you made to yourself. You're going to have to act on this. You're going to have to make a difference in this space. So I definitely got into this space to make a difference, got everything pretty much started. And then my girlfriends, um, Keisha Knight Pulliam, she's played Rudy on the Cosby show. She's like, I'm in for this mission. Ayanna Parsons, she was in School of Business and Industry with me at FAMU. We got our five-year MBA programs. We were in there together. She was like, I'm on board for this. I'm like, thank you. And they're like, we're going to make history with this. Now, what we didn't expect, we are the first woman of color fund that's built by us for us. We had no clue of that. We just got into the space to have a multi-million dollar fund investing in startups for people who look like us, but it wasn't into the media with Forbes and Fortune and people were just like, oh, they're the first to do this. And I'm like, this can't be. I'm like, are, are you serious? I know we don't want to be the last, so please come join us. <laughs> but when we heard that, we were like, oh my gosh, the industry is 80% white male. It's 2% African-American of that that are females or less than that. Um, and very few, even in our own race demographic, have their own funds. They're pretty much working for another fund. 
So I was just like, oh my gosh, we are far and few between. Then what we realized is we knew it was underserved based upon the statistics, but when we got into the work of it, we started to see it. So the first pitch competition, Sarah Blakely hosted it at Spanx for us. Um, we announced it and there was like, oh my gosh, thousands of applicants in hours to the point where I tell my assistant, just stop that right now because we, we don't know how we're going to data mine all of this and get through this for this one event. So just push pause. And then we had another one at the Facebook headquarters. Again, thousands of applications. I mean, it's, it's overwhelming. So for example, to apply to our fund, we set a criteria that you need to be revenue generating 100,000 annual reoccurring revenue. But the reality is the women we've been investing in lately, they've already been gotten to millions. So it just shows you how underserved the area is to where I'm just like, oh, gosh. So we have like this whole gap of people we're trying to help that because we didn't know we'd be helping. So at this end, you know, to where we'd be in the where our portfolio companies were already in the mills before they came to us. And I'm like, oh, gosh, now we have to figure out how do we also serve over here? So recently we came up with our Get Venture Ready program that launches in the beginning of the year that people can apply for now so that you can get ready to present to investors, that you have your corporate governance in place, that you have your pitch pitches in place, your pitch deck. You're going to go through pitching workshops. you got to have to go through product market fit so we can make sure this is a good, viable business, that you have your MVP together, your most viable product. Like there's so many different things just to get venture ready. And we want to make sure that they are venture ready, that our demographic has three disparities, access to capital, um, lack of mentorship and lack of network. So we're trying to make sure that we can provide as much in that area for people. So that's our educational side of what we're doing too. Our portfolio companies, I mean, they're rock stars. I'm so excited about all of the women that we're able to invest in. Um, yeah, we got so many great announcements coming. I'm just, I'm, I'm in bliss with it because don't get me wrong, it's a great investment but it's also good for my heart and my soul and it's serving, you know, it's a great investment. They're going to return extremely great returns. It's already been proven, but it's so good for my soul to be able to cut these different six figure checks for these women. And they're just like, this is really going to help me employ people and make a difference in the community. And I'm just like, wow, wow. I'm sorry. My heart's <laughs> bursting. No, do not be sorry. My heart is bursting because when we first talked about this on your tour, I could feel it, but I was like, I want this. I want the richer, fuller conversation. I also want to keep talking about it offline because I, you know, if there's anything I can do to support, it, oh, I want to thank support. you. Are you kidding? This is like, you know, again, part of the reason that I am still doing what I'm doing is I love seeing people win. I love seeing yes. people win. And unlike you, you know, I don't have an MBA. And so witnessing folks f from every different background who have an idea and they bring it to market and they make a difference in their customers' lives, it's like, it brings me to tears because it's so fulfilling and people it change generationally. Yes. What, what people see as possible. And so I'm just like, I'm so, I'm so happy. I'm so happy for you. And oh, I am so happy you. for the businesses and all of the lives uh, that you're touching and will continue to touch through this. It's very exciting. What have been, have there been any, um, you, you spoke into the challenge around not recognizing like, whoa, we thought we were going to serve this particular demographic in the business in terms of hitting, you know, they've done over six figures and wow, the folks we're investing in are actually over a million. Have there been any other unexpected challenges or gifts around launching the Fearless Fund? Anything oh. else that you didn't expect? <laughs> oh, I can get into it. Oh, it, this, this is not for the faint. <laughs> I will say that this is not for the faint at heart. We're not the first because this was easy. We're the first for a reason, okay? <laughs> first of all, we had to get SEC regulated. I mean, like this is approved by the government. <laughs> so yeah. you're talking about, about, you're talking months of paperwork just to get established. And yeah. months of, um, death, yeah, months of paperwork and a lot of resources, even financially, just to get something like this started. Um, I will say when, it, when we're even talking earlier about people and them and people, they're, they're projecting their fears onto you. So I will get into that. So yeah. we're like the new kids on the block in the space. And everybody was just like, oh, it's your first fund. Well, don't expect institutional investors. Don't expect this. 
Don't expect that. And I refused all of that energy. <laughs> I'm like, you're yeah, not about I'm to proje- projecting that. Yeah, you're not about to project that onto me. So that's why I, I'm so excited. We have amazing institutional investors. We've got to make some huge announcements um, coming up. So I can't say just yet, but I mean, people who are in our space, they're very well aware. We, we have amazing institutional investors from governments to banks to nonprofit institutions. So that's why I'm just like, yeah, to corporations. I'm like, you save that for yourself. That was your reality, but that doesn't have to be mine. Okay. <laughs> um, so that happened. <laughs> I will definitely say that. So that's why I like, I can't wait to post these announcements so they can just read about it. <laughs> yes. But yes. Yeah, so that was definitely, I would say one thing, um, raising capital in a, in a space where you don't even have a network. So mind you, I'm shifting complete industries. You know, I come from the PR and marketing world and running this business and now I'm in the venture capital world and I'm having to learn who the players are and who these people are and network and befriend and be at events. And I'm like, okay. But I remember what that experience was like before. And I mind you, I did it even from one, the comfort of the car, then the comfort of the office. So I've been, I see how the dots are aligned and connect through my life. So I'm definitely prepared, you know, for it, thank God. But it was, it was complete new territory. So people were like, are you having imposter syndrome? And I'm like, I'm just having to show up as my full self. <laughs> I'm like, so at first you walk in, like I said, it's, it's heavily white male. That just is what it is. So I don't look yep. like anybody else in the room. And I'm like, okay, well, Arian, you're going to have to show up as your full self. And my authenticity, and I would even say our team's authenticity, has definitely, I would say, has been our winning factor. People are attracted to what we're building. They like that we've stepped out, you know, to take a risk to even be in the space. And I remember even, I mean, some meetings I showed up with even with a pink pink wig on. But (laughs) I... I have shown up in my full self. Keisha has shown up in her full self. Ayana has shown up in her full self. And it has yielded great dividends just from us being us. Yeah. So excited for you. It feels like the beginning of something so big. And I'm going to be here cheering. Like I said, we could talk offline about different ways. uh, Be happy to support. But thank you. Thank you for continuing to take risks. Thank you. You are such a bright and brilliant human being and your faith and your consistency and your positivity. It's just, it's really inspiring. It's really, really inspiring. So as we wrap up today, wait, um, I have to know, pause because I know you okay, wrap okay. up, but <laughs> this means so much coming from you. I had no, it does. I had a whole moment before I said, Arian, I said, you are living the life that you dreamed of. I remember when I used to study you guys, Marie Forleo, back in the day, okay? I was addicted to watching the YouTubes. I was on your website every day. I was just like an addict before I met you, (laughs) but I just never shared it. And even, oh, I know somebody, my old, old, old graphic artist, of course, she'd be like, oh my gosh, Arian loves Marie. Like, so just to see that I am in the midst of people who have been, who I've admired that are just now peers. And I'm just like, I had that moment this morning. I'm like, Arian, you're living out your dreams. I was like, don't you remember how you were just like, oh, everything Marie, everything Marie. (laughs) I said, this is so wild. So I had that moment this morning. So I just want to thank you for definitely just walking in your calling and in your purpose and being an inspiration to me. Oh, I I wish I could reach through the screen and hug hug you. Yes, in (laughs) virtual safe. And when we don't need to do safe, just that hugs is the thing I miss. Thank you for what you shared. You are just, you're such a powerful soul. And the reason, like part of the reason I do what I do, I just, I love people and I love connecting with people and I love the sharing of ideas and possibility. And like, you are such a beacon of this. And every, I have so many underlines in your book. Um, And you know, this is what it's about. It's about people connecting and showing what's possible and collaborating and looking for ways to go like, what good can we do together? 
how can we share ideas? How can we share networks? Like I was just, as you were talking, I'm, I'm thinking about like thinking about B-schoolers. I'm thinking about, oh, this is another thing I want to say before we wrap up. Um, you know, I'm always surprised and delighted by the notes that I receive because you never know who's watching the show, right? You never know who's listening to the podcast. If folks are listening right now and they are like, thinking about, obviously we want them to get the book. Yes, yes, yes. But in terms of the fearless fund, where should they go if they are interested in learning about all the things that you guys got coming up? Who knows? There might be other people that want to participate. Where can they learn more and, and, and yes. get involved? At fearless.fund, F-U-N-D. Yep. Fearless.fund. It's all there. And as we wrap up, what do you want people to take away most from, from the book, from Fearless Money Mindset? If someone's right now sitting and they're like, whoa, 2020 has been a year, money's been uh, perhaps a point of pain for them, whether it's always been that way or this year put them in a precarious position, what would you want to leave someone with? The subtitle would be the reason about the broke doesn't scare me. I would want to leave them with, you can always start today. You can always start today. You can be at rock bottom, it's okay. You can always just start today. Let's talk about honoring our fear as a guide back to love. What mm -hmm. does that mean in practical terms? Can you give us an example? Yeah, this is uh, something that came up towards the end of the book as I was writing and I felt really called to not wrap the book up by saying, okay, now you're fixed, like everything's good, right? <laughs> <laughs> but to really honor what comes up in every moment because in my book, The Universe Has Your Back, I talk about spiritual assignments, that when things come up, they're an assignment offering us an opportunity to grow and heal. And that's what our, any fear-based experience is just revealing to us the hidden parts of our shadow or a fearful thought that's coming up again or an experience that feels like a block is once again revealing to us something that we still need to heal. And so honoring our fear rather than resisting it honoring the moments in our life that are the most uncomfortable because they reveal to us the light that we're ready to step into. Mm. And so it's it's a very big reframe, particularly when you're going through really tough times. But when you're going through really tough times, you need that reframe most. And I've been celebrating a lot of the miracles that have been happening since I've been going through this journey of, of the postpartum stuff that comes up. I have had so many miracles, so many miracles of being able to, and even just to be able, the miracle of being able to speak about it publicly to take away the shame and the stigma of it. Yeah. So we have to see the purpose in why we go through things. Yeah. I love it. And all of us are going to hit those fearful moments and to see it as a, an opportunity to guide ourselves back to love, it just, it makes my, my shoulders rest mm -hmm. a little easier mm -hmm. and gives me an opportunity to take a breath, which is really, really beautiful. I've got a little bit of something new here. So some of the kiddos of our Team Forleo parents were really, really excited about <laughs> us having you on the show. And so they actually have a few questions for you, if that's okay. Yay. One of the kiddos says, how can someone get over the fear of big waves? Okay. So my advice, if you do want to go and get out there in the big surf, it starts with just being confident with your swimming. Um, when I was young, I did swim team, and so that helped me a lot when it came to being in the ocean and being around bigger waves, and I realized that I'm such a strong swimmer. If anything happened, I can swim myself out of the situation, and everything will be okay. But also, it took time to, you know, I, I worked my way up. I didn't just go from little itty bitty waves to the huge ones, I slowly got more and more confident in the bigger and bigger surf. And over time, I got, I just became normal. So sometimes I'll go out in certain surf and my heart's not pumping at all because the waves don't feel scary to me. But then I'll go in really um, extra big surf. And I'm like, my heart is pounding. I am you know, all senses are fired and my guard's up, but I'm also like ready to tackle it at the same time. <laughs> Bethany, what's like one of the biggest waves that you've surfed? Um, it's hard to say, but definitely as big as houses, um, 
There's one that maybe measured around 40 or 50 feet. Um, it's, a wave called, <laughs> it's a wave called Jaws. And so it's a type of surfing called toe surfing where you have a jet ski like pull you into the wave. And it was incredible. <laughs> Is that something that at this point where you're at in your journey that you still crave? Like, are you still going like, I need some really big waves? There's definitely that kind of love hate. And I think it's like the mother intuition kicking in because like I I have deep respect for the ocean and I have yeah. that kind of lurking fear and like just knowledge that it's powerful. So part of me wants to be there and then part of me doesn't just for the sake of the worst case scenario happening. But when I do surf that sort of wave, I usually go fully prepared. I'm usually wearing a helmet, a life preserving jacket. There's a safety team. So it just kind of depends, but I definitely have craving for solid waves. <laughs> so this is another question from the kiddos on Team Forleo. They said, you've done so many cool things. What's something you haven't done, but you really want to do? Oh my goodness. I know they're great, wow. right? Asking such good questions. Yeah. Um, um, well, I guess a lot of my dreams now have to do with my kids. I really just, I haven't taken my kids to the snow yet. So I really want to take them to the snow and take them skiing or snowboarding. Um, trying to think there's somewhere in the world I wanted to visit. Um, I don't know, just probably involving more travel, um, maybe go to Alaska as a family. That's where my husband and I went for our honeymoon. So we want to go there again um, and just kind of adventure the world and surf different waves. And I'm pretty easy to please. I don't need a whole lot to be happy. Um, as long as I'm near the ocean, it, it's usually all good. <laughs> Oh my goodness, you made it all the way to the end. Good on you. But let's not stop here. Keep the momentum going. You're going to love this next episode. Click it, watch it now, and I'll catch you there. A well-documented phenomenon called negativity bias, which is the tendency for us humans to pay more attention and give more weight to negative experiences over neutral or positive ones. 